Chapter Twelve of The Caves of Fear by John Blaine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Twelve: The Buddhist Monk. The party topped a high rise and stopped, spellbound at the scene that spread before them. They were on the rim of a great valley. Far on the other side of the valley stood the high peaks of the Himalayas, a mighty screen between them and India. Below, a lush green path marked the course of a wide river. On either side of it, sloping up to the mountains, was the lighter green of grasslands. Singh pointed. There is Corset Lincoln. Rick had to look hard before he saw it. Then he began to make it out. The monastery was built under a great cliff on one side of the valley. At first glance it seemed like part of the cliff itself. It was huge, with tier after tier of grey stone buildings rising in piled masses from the valley floor. Around it, like tiny mounds of earth, were the hair tents of the Tibetans. Magnificent! Zircon rumbled. Well worth coming to see even if we find nothing at the end of the trail. We'll find Chada, Scotty said. I'm sure we will, and the sooner the better. Rick felt the same way. Now that the end of the trail was in sight, excitement was rising within him. He was anxious to find his Hindu friend, and to find, at the same time, answers to some of the mysteries they had encountered. Let's hurry, he said impatiently. Singh shouted at the bearers, and the party took a narrow trail that dipped into the valley. Scotty rode ahead with Singh, and his rifle was ready for instant use. Rick and Zircon brought up the rear, their own rifles held ready. They had taken no chances since the fight on the hilltop. Worthington Co. had been left afoot far behind them, but there was no assurance his friends hadn't come to the rescue with horses. Rick kept glancing behind him, just in case of an attack from the rear. They had reached the rim of the valley by mid-morning. All through the day they had made their way down the mountain, reaching the valley floor about three in the afternoon. Another two hours of steady travel took them past the yurts of Tibetan herders, conical tents made of horsehair felt. These stolid Tibetans watched them pass, no interest in their beady eyes. Then, as darkness began to set in, they reached the monastery. Corsa Lincoln towered above them, already shadowed in twilight. From somewhere within the great pile they heard the tinkle of bells, then the deep tones of a mighty gong. Lamas, priests in yellow robes, walked past with bowed heads. Some of them spun their prayer wheels and intoned the Buddhist ritual. Om Mani Padme Om, hail the jewel in the lotus. The jewel, of course, was the Lord Buddha. They watched the pageant for a few moments, enthralled. Then Zircon commanded Singh, find someone you can talk to. We'll want to see the High Lama. Singh nodded. I will go into the monastery. The bearers will find a place to camp. He issued orders in Chinese. The bearers scattered at once, searching for a suitable place to pitch camp. The three Americans sat their horses and watched the activities around the great monastery, too interested even to talk. Rick saw countless yellow robes on the various balconies. There must be thousands of monks, he thought, and there were an equal number of Tibetans, many of them already busy at cooking fires near the base of the grey stone buildings. He smelled mutton cooking, and the acrid, unpleasant odor he had learned to identify with yak butter. Hot buttered tea was a Tibetan staple. He had tried it on the trail, because he was interested in everything, even yak butter. But he didn't think it would ever take the place of ice cream in his affections. One of the bearers came back and motioned to them. They followed as he led the pack mules to a place in the shelter of a great rock. The other bearers were foraging for wood. In a few moments, a fire was going, and camp was being set up. Singh returned. No one may see the High Lama. 
he reported. He is in the middle of some kind of ceremony that takes a month. But I talked with an important priest. He was friendly. He said he would send one of the lamas to be our guide and to help us find our friend. Good, Zircon said. Now, let's have some dinner. I'm famished. The boys echoed his sentiments. It was fully dark before they ended their meal. They were squatting around the fire, sipping coffee, and listening to Zircon's description of the Buddhist ritual when one of the bearers suddenly called out. The three Americans and Singh reached for their weapons as a yellow-robed lama shuffled out of the darkness. This, evidently, was their guide. He was of less than medium height, but that was all Rick could tell about him. His loose robe draped around his body, and his cowl was pulled up, hiding his face. Welcome, Zircon boomed. Sing, speak to him, and tell him we are grateful for his coming. Sing spoke to the monk in Chinese. The robed lama stood immobile, just within range of the firelight. The yellow flames made shadows across his cowled figure. Rick felt a little shudder run through him. The quiet figure was somehow weird. Singh shifted to another language, but the lama made no reply. Then, slowly, he brought his hands up level, outstretched toward them. He chanted slowly, his voice muffled under the cowl. Then the chant died and his hands were lowered once more. Singh turned to the group. I don't know what he said. It's not in a language I understand. He spoke to the apparition. The monk stood motionless. Wish they'd sent us someone we could talk with, Scotty grumbled. A lot of use this joker will be. The monk's cowl turned slowly toward Scotty. The figure moved majestically toward the boy, then the hands lifted again. From under the cowl a sepulchral voice issued. Could be more use than you think, mutton head. For an instant there was stunned silence. Then Rick and Scotty leaped for the robed figure with yells of delight. Rick hit him high and Scotty hit him low. They held him down and pulled the cowl from him then pommeled him unmercifully, while Zircon cheered them on. Only when the monk begged for mercy did they let him up. He tossed the robe aside and grinned at them. Okay, Chada said, you win, but it took you plenty time to get here. Why you take so long? The slim Hindu boy hugged them solemnly, one at a time, and shook hands with Singh. Now, he announced, I eat. Got plenty sick of sheep meat, you bet. Then they were all laughing and talking at once while the cook hastened to prepare a meal. In a few moments, Chada was attacking a high-piled plate and talking between bites. Good you came now, he said. I got plenty worry. You find Bradley? Zircon told him of the meeting in the hotel. Chada nodded. Good. I think he show up soon. Start at the beginning, Rick demanded. There's a whole lot we don't know. In fact, if you come right down to it, we don't know anything. Okay, Chada took a sip of coffee. I start at start, in Bombay. Chada had been visiting with his family in Bombay when Bradley arrived in the Indian city. The two had met by accident. Chada had gone to the Taj Mahal Hotel to write a letter to the boys, because there was no paper or ink at home. Bradley, who happened to be in the lobby, had noticed the address on the envelope as Chada handed it to the desk clerk. Once the scientist discovered that Chada knew the Spindrift group and had been on expeditions with them, the rest followed naturally. Bradley, realizing that the clever little Hindu boy would be of great value in his undercover work, had hired him. Chada didn't say so, but Rick could understand that such was the case. Chada's duties had been those of general assistant. He had cared for baggage, run errands, 
acted as secretary, and on a few occasions had been assigned to follow people in whose destinations Bradley was interested. The two had gone from Bombay to New Delhi and Calcutta, then to Singapore. At Singapore, while following up another matter, Bradley accidentally had discovered that heavy water was being sold. He was much excited, Chada said. I did not know why. Heavy water? I asked myself, what is heavy water? I knew about ice, which is frozen water, and which is heavy. But who would have much excitement about ice? The Sahib Bradley hurried to the Consulate of America, and he sent a cable to Washington. Then the scientist had assigned Chada to watch a certain house in Singapore, the place from which the heavy water was being taken to unknown destinations. Chada had watched for three days without relief, and he had seen Worthington Co. Then, since Bradley had not come for him, he deserted his post long enough to return to their quarters, a room in an obscure Chinese hotel in Singapore. There he had found evidence of a fight and bloodstains on the floor. There was no sign of Bradley. It was then, Chada guessed, that Long Shadow had found him. He saw the shadow several times while he hunted for Bradley. Then, while searching for his boss in the Tamil quarter, he had been attacked by Chinese thugs led by Worthington Co. They had beaten him into insensibility, hustled him into a taxi, and were carrying him somewhere into the inland of Malaya. When he regained consciousness, he escaped by going headlong through a window while the car was traveling and then taking cover in the jungle alongside the road. Going by a roundabout route, he reached Singapore again. There he found that their luggage was held by the hotel and the room had been rented to someone else. Chada polished his plate with a biscuit and groaned expressively. I say to myself then, Chada, now is time to think real hard. What to do? He knew that the cable Bradley had sent asked for Hartson Brandt to be assigned to the job, and he knew also that from Singapore they were to head for Hong Kong. He knew nothing about Hong Kong, but he did know that Bradley was acquainted at a place called the Golden Mouse, because he had heard him mention it to a Chinese, the scientist used for undercover work, now and then. The long shadow came again while I was thinking, Chada continued. I saw it in front of the hotel, so I went quick fast out the back and ran through many places until I was sure he could not find me. I went to where many Indians live in Singapore, and I found a friend. The friend, another Indian, had gone to the United States Information Library in Singapore and borrowed a copy of the World Almanac. Chada already had decided he would cable the boys, and how he would do it. He knew, because of what they had told him, that they would be able to figure out a book code, and that they would realize his choice naturally would be the almanac. Knowing the annual by heart, he naturally also knew the table that converted Roman numerals to Arabic numbers and had used the letter L as a clue to the right volume. But how did you know about nulls? Rick asked. Oh, that was very lucky. I learned how to put Sahib Bradley's messages in code, and there were many nulls. He grinned impishly. Of course, I did not know if you also knew what are nulls. I was thinking they are two who are good with science, but are they also good with code? Maybe not. But, anyway, there are plenty smart to read a book. That would tell them about nulls. We didn't have to read a book, Scotty said. Dad told us about them. Scientist father, also plenty smart even without books, Chada agreed. Anyway, I make the message, and I send cable. Rick interrupted again. How did you know Ko had a glass eye? Chada smiled. When they capture me, I fight like maybe ten wild elephants. I kick Honorable Mr. Ko in the face, and what happens is glasses fall off, and one of his eyes falls out. 
also it breaks when it falls and i see it is glass i am so surprised i forget to fight and someone hits me from the back of my neck and then all is dark i did not know mr ko's name then my boss tells me it later no more questions for the moment zircon ordered i want to hear the rest of this go ahead chara the hindu boy had used his friend as a go-between and had arranged with the council general to advance him funds since the official knew he worked for bradley that was not difficult then he had arranged for their baggage to be shipped and held at the airport in hong kong and had taken a plane there himself at the golden mouse canton charlie had given him quarters in another day bradley showed up the scientist had been caught in the singapore hotel room by ko and company but had fought his way clear there wasn't time to leave a note for chada at the hotel and he didn't dare return to the room for fear of having the enemy locate him again so he had depended on chada's wits to tell him the next step and had gone ahead to hong kong hoping to find more information about the heavy water at hong kong long shadow had shown up again bradley in the meantime had not been idle through his various sources of information he had determined that the source of the heavy water was in the neighborhood of corsa lincoln chada was instructed to go there at once and start reconnoitering while they waited for the party from the states bradley deliberately dropped the disguise he had been using that of a portuguese seaman and let long shadow locate him then he had started out hoping to draw the enemy away from chada long enough for the boy to get clear and start for corsa lincoln bradley was to shake the enemy when he could and resume his investigation finding the source of the water was not enough he had said it also was necessary to find out how it was reaching singapore and what its ultimate destination might be Chada had experience with Buddhist monasteries dating back to the time when he had worked in Nepal. Also, many Indians were Buddhists. There were some in almost every monastery, and of that number, a few could be depended on to speak Hindi, or Hindustani, as it was called, which was Chada's language. He also knew a little Tibetan from his years in Nepal. I came here easy chada finished there was a big lot of pilgrims and they took me in he grinned they thought i was a monk and i found indians like i had thought they hid me so i do not think long shadow knows i am here and now i know where the heavy water comes from zircon gave an exclamation chada you're a marvel where does it come from tomorrow i show you chada promised who is long shadow rick demanded chada shrugged not knowing we never see him only the shadow scotty stirred up the fire a little how come canton charlie didn't turn you over to the enemy as he did us what chada was astonished scotty quickly outlined their adventures while chada listened thoughtfully when he had finished the indian boy shook his head something bad wrong charlie is one of bradley's men my boss pays him and he is friendly you say charlie told you to go to this junk rick thought back charlie himself actually had not told them they had not seen charlie when the note was dropped on their table charlie himself didn't tell us he stated it could have been one of long shadow's men or one of ko's and that portuguese with the knife could have been one of long shadow's men too i'll bet he was the one who put the finger on us he must have heard us ask for chada long shadow and his men knew chada of course and they would certainly try to get rid of reinforcements like us right zircon agreed perhaps the fault was ours in not waiting for charlie to tell us himself although i don't see how we could have known i think that is it chada said charlie is a friend so the men on the junk with purple sails were long shadows and you plenty lucky you get out with your skins 
believe me. Zircon rubbed his chin. Chana, our instructions from Bradley were to bring a rubber boat and a Nansen bottle. That must mean the heavy water source has something to do with a lake or a river. Is that true? Don't know about those things, Chada said. I know only that the heavy water comes from a place near here. I know how to get there, and I will take you. I do not think we will like this place much. It has a bad name. What kind of bad name? Scotty asked. In English, Chada said, it is the Caves of Fear. End of chapter 12